Uh, today what we want to do is finish up this discussion of the money multiplier and go along and uh, get ahead and talk about the Federal Reserve and its monetary policies. If you remember, just the broad outlines of what we talked about before is the Fed stands outside the economy and injects funds into the economy. And what we said is that there's a multiplier relationship between the amount the Fed injects into the economy and what happens to the money supply. If the Federal Reserve, I think we were working with a number of $1,000, if the Federal Reserve injects $1,000 into the economy, what we saw last time is that the money supply will go up by some multiple amount. And it's not the number we used last time, but I'll just use hypothetically, there's an increase uh, in the money supply of $3,000. Uh, $3, and in this particular case, there would be a money multiplier of three. Okay, and so what we were doing last time is talking about how this multiplier is created. What is the source of this? And um, uh, I think I told you that historically just the feeling was, oh, and it could have been, by the way, in the old days, like gold would enter the United States when we had the gold standard and the United States, somebody here would export something overseas, the foreigner sends gold, and then the assumption is that whether it was gold or the Federal Reserve or however these funds enter the economy, if there's another $1,000 worth of funds injected in the economy, we'll say by the Fed, then the money supply goes up by $1,000. And then it was only after we started measuring these things in relatively recent times that we realized there was a multiplier effect. And then what I told you is in the mid to late 1960s, economists started working on the mathematical relationship. And I put that formula up there uh, last time, and we'll do it again this time. It's not all that complicated, but it's not something that people just knew without actually stopping and studying it and so forth, putting the concepts together. What makes this happen? Two ideas. The one idea is this, is fractional reserve banking. If you get $1,000 into your hand and you make a deposit of some of that money in the Federal Reserve, or in your bank, pardon me, that your banker will hold only a fraction of that. What did we have last time? It was seven, no, it was $800. If you have $1,000 in currency, let's say the Federal Reserve hands that to you, you put, in our example last time, $800 in the bank, you hold $200 in cash. And now that banker says, oh, I've got $800 coming in, in a deposit. We'll credit your account so the money supply is the same. Your currency part is $200. Your checking account part is $800. But then the banker says, hey, I have $800 deposit. I'll set aside 10%. I'll lend the excess reserve, which was, in this case, the 90% of that deposit, $720. And it's the loan, and this is the second part, is fractional reserve banking. And then the second part is lending out excess reserves. And it's that loan from the bank that enters the money supply. And so now we have a multiple expansion of the money supply. And so we went from $1,000 from the Fed, and just one round of this, we're up to $1,720 money supply. And then we went through that whole process. Whoever borrows the money spends it. Then the person that they spend it with, the seller of goods, deposits in their bank. Their bank holds a fraction and loans the rest. And now there was another round of increase in the money supply. And I have the numbers here someplace, but yeah, I won't even look. 600 and some dollars, I believe, maybe 700 or 500 and some dollars. But anyway, and then this process continued until we had a, uh, an increase in the money supply of, was it 500 and, I mean, $3,571.43. Uh, let's see if I can remember that. 3,700. 3,500. Seventy-one dollars and what did I say? Forty-three cents. And so our multiplier in that case was three point five seven one point well four three. Okay. The money multiplier that we had, I told you there was a relationship. Here's the M1 money supply is this letter I'm gonna call it later on the monetary base. These are the, the funds that the Federal Reserve injects into the economy. 
okay? And in this case, that was $1,000. But anyway, times, and now here's our multiplier, 1 plus C over D. The C over D is the ratio of currency to checking deposits for basically everybody in the private sector. And what I told you is that this ratio does not change all that much over time. Uh, and by over time, I mean from one month to the next. If you, know, you go away for 20 years and come back, it would have changed. Okay. But anyway, and so the ratio of currency to checking deposits in the hands of the non-banking public. This is not what the government holds. It's not what banks hold. If banks had currency, we'd call it vault cash or reserves. This is the public. And it's, so if you hold, it's the example we had last time, if you hold, um, what would it be, $20 in currency whenever you have $80 in checking deposits, and that was the example we used last time, this ratio would be 0.25. Right? And so what we have in the numerator is 1. 0.25. In the denominator, we had that same currency deposit ratio and then the ratio of bank reserves to deposits. Okay, and so for the banking system as a whole, how much are they holding on reserve? They either have it in their vault or at the Fed, but how much are they holding on reserve for all banks and then how much are checking deposits at all banks? And there is a ratio there. And last time I used the ratio of 10%. Okay, like what? $80 on reserve on an $800 deposit. And so this would have been a 10% uh, ratio. And so this thing in the big brackets here is our money multiplier. And it's 1.25 over 0.35. And that was our 3.57143, I believe. Now, where will I go next? There are some other multipliers. This is the multiplier for M1. The M1 money supply multiplier. It's got those two things in it, currency and checking deposits. Okay. Here are a couple of other multipliers. Suppose that we want to know the total amount of currency in the economy. How much currency is in the economy? We saw this multiple uh, process of expansion last time. How much currency is there? Here's what we know for sure. Those dollars the Federal Reserve injected into the economy, what we call monetary base, all of those $1,000 ended up either people holding currency or ended up in banks as reserves. And by the way, that's what the monetary base, that's where it ends up is either as currency or as bank reserves. Okay, but how much currency? And the answer is, it's the monetary base times, we'll say, a currency multiplier. And the currency multiplier, fortunately, has the same denominator. But the numerator is just this, the currency deposit ratio. So it would be 0.25 over point, what do we have, three five? Or five sevenths. And I do that whole lowest common denominator thing. And how much is five sevenths? Anybody know that number? Do we know that number? <laughs> I thought I told you to get that. Point seven one four two nine. And so if we had a monetary base of $1,000, this would be $714.29. How much is in checking accounts in the economy? You know what? There are two ways of finding that out. We know the money supply was, what, $3,500? $71.43. If you know how much is in 
currency, 714.29, then you could just subtract to find out how much is in deposits. But that bad man that gives you tests may not give you an opportunity to use that method. And so what we'd want to do is we'd want to recognize that there is a multiplier times m, the multiplier for checking deposits. And the multiplier for checking deposits, fortunately, has the same denominator as all these other multipliers, c over d plus r over d. And the numerator? One. And so it's one divided by 0.35 equals, let me just guess. That means get your calculator out. Tell me how much. 2.85. I can't go further than that in my head. How much? 1 divided by 0 0.35. 2.85714. Is that right? Thank you. I'm just going to 3 out. Just going to 3 out. And so then we take that $1,000 times 2.87514, and that's $2,857.14. And so, now by the way, let me kind of close the loop here before we go on. All three of these multipliers have the same denominator, so let's look at the numerator. Here's one plus the currency deposit ratio. Okay, well these correspond to these other two smaller multipliers. The one is for the checking deposits, that's the numerator of that, and the currency deposit ratio is the numerator in the currency multiplier. And so those two multipliers added together are 1 plus C over D divided by that common denominator. Okay? Do you need to know that on test day? No. Not, not if you don't care about your grade. But if you would like to get a good grade, yeah, that would be a good idea. Want to work a problem or you just say, eh, I got it. We'll work a problem. Let's uh, let the currency deposit ratio equal, I don't know, 0.42. Let's let the reserve deposit ratio equal 0.17. And now you should be able to calculate three multipliers for me, the M1 multiplier, the de uh, checking deposit multiplier, and the currency multiplier. And of course, since you're all pretty clever, you can do most of these in your head. Did I say pretty clever? I mean very clever. Okay, first thing I always do when I'm working on these is see if I can get these two ratios added together so I know my denominator on all of them. What do we have here? 1.42 over 0.59, anybody? Two point 2.406, 7, huh? I'll tell you what, I don't want to stop at 6 if there's a 7 that follows it. I want to round up. 7, 7, 9, seven, seven, nine that's probably far enough. Huh? 6, 6, 1. You know, that's far enough. It's plenty far if you're dealing with like $1,000 times that. You get down to pennies pretty fast. But if you're dealing with like... $800 billion, and then you multiply it by that. You know, you can come out here and like to that six right there, and that's probably how much I'll make in my career. And so it really depends on um, just exactly, you know, what numbers we're dealing with. 
So then 1 over 0.59 would be about 1.6 what? 949. Uh, 949. And what's the single number after that? 1? Okay, I'll leave it alone. And then 0 0.42 over 0 0.59 is about 0 0.7? What? 119. And in theory, these two smaller multipliers add up to be the big one. I know that's all a theory, but it should work out that way. How much are in bank reserves? How would we figure out how much is in bank reserves? Well, if we had a monetary base of, a, and we'll use $1,000, if we had a monetary base of $1,000 and we multiplied it by this multiplier, then we'd say, hey, total deposits equal 1,000 times 1 1.6949, so that would be 1694.90. And then reserves would be, what, 17% of that, right? So that's about $289 or something like that? How much is it? Anybody? 17% of 1694.90? 288? I thought it was going to be 289. 288, how much? 0.13. These things all fit together, though, these concepts. And so if you have a good understanding of it, you can go from one to the next. Okay, so the reserves of 288, and there will be $711.90 worth of currency would add up to the monetary base of $1,000. All right? Okay. So, we okay with this? Now, let me kind of finish this up. What a mess this looks like. These ratios are determined in the private sector. This ratio, currency deposits, people and companies decide how much, or basically how to divide up their monetary assets. Okay, you decide how much currency to hold. If you have $1,000 of money, then you decide how much of that's currency and how much of it's going to be in your checking account. What would influence that? You'd be influenced by things like this. Hey, I have a debit card, and so I'll leave most of that money in my checking account, and so I can carry this debit card around and get access to currency pretty easily. If there's an ATM machine on every corner, again, maybe leave the money in your account and don't carry around so much cash. Let's say there were no uh, uh, debit cards, there's no ATM machines, and let's say your banks are open one hour a day. Then you might say, wow, this is so inconvenient to get cash, I'm going to carry quite a bit of cash around. So the state of technology could influence us, right? And just how many ATM machines and, and so forth are there. Uh, so technology, it partly would be dependent on whether you travel a lot. And like if you get to an out-of-town bank, then maybe you feel like you need, or, or out of town, maybe you need to carry a little bit more currency just because you're not near things, you know, people that know you that would uh, accept your check and so forth. Or it might be the opposite, that you're out of town and you don't want to carry currency. That would be up to you, but your own behavior would influence it. And how about this? If you were getting interest, let's say they were paying you 8% interest on a checking account and no interest on your currency, then you might say, wow, 8%, that's a lot. I'll leave as much as possible in my checking account. So there are things that affect companies and people on this ratio. Those things do not change rapidly. And since they do not change rapidly, this ratio doesn't change rapidly. What we'll see sometimes is that over time, this ratio might trend downward, but it might be over a course of five years or something like that, and it might go down from like 0.42 to 
three, nine, or something like that over a long period of time. And so it's got a trend to it, but not rapidly. Not from month to month. Um, what's a, what about this ratio of bank reserves to checking deposits? Banks determine this, and also the Federal Reserve. Because the Federal Reserve sets required reserve ratio, this really is two components added together. There's required reserves as a fraction of deposits. That's the part the Federal Reserve sets. And then there's excess reserves as a fraction of deposits. And so the Fed sets the one. By the way, I should have put a plus sign in there. The Fed sets the one, and the other is set by banks. And so it might be that this is 0.17. Well, possibly 0.15 would be the Fed's required reserve ratio. And what the Fed is saying is this, if it's 0.15, you hold 15% as much in required reserves as you hold in deposits. Checking deposits is what we're talking about. And then banks might say, you know what? We're going to hold another 2% of our deposits as excess reserves. Bankers would decide that for themselves. Now, this one is set by policy, but the other one, bankers might say something like this. You know, interest rates are very low. Let's say interest rates on loans are 2%. Bankers say, eh, you know, 2%'s not much. If we've got some excess reserves, we're not giving up that much interest to just set on top of that money, this vault cash or whatever. If the interest rate's 20%, bankers say, I don't want to hold excess reserves. Every dollar I hold is a dollar not loaned out, and that means I'm not getting 20%. And so that is an issue as well. And so what I'm saying to you is this, is there is a combination of people and companies, but the private sector, and then bankers and the Federal Reserve, and all of us sort of working together or against each other or on our own, we decide what that money multiplier is going to be. Okay, And sometimes that uh, changes in un unpredictable ways. Let me just talk about this very briefly because Something very notable happened in history. Let's talk about this currency deposit ratio. 1929, well, I'm going to really go to In 1930, a big bank, one of the largest banks in the United States, in New York City, failed. And I talked about this already, where I was talking about deposit. This is before there was any deposit insurance. And I told you about people started getting nervous about their bank. They said, wow, that big bank in New York failed. And not only is it a big bank, but some people thought, oh, that's that government bank. And it really wasn't, but that was the, you know, the misunderstanding. This got a lot of notoriety. And so what happened across the United States is people started getting a little bit nervous about their bank. I wonder if my bank's safe. So what people started doing is this. They started saying, gosh, since my bank could fail, maybe I ought to do a little something precautionary. Maybe I ought to just go down at the bank and take some money out and put it in, you know, under my mattress or whatever. I don't know if anybody actually keeps money under their mattress, but maybe I ought to take control of this money situation by going to get it out of the bank. And so if people, and I don't mean to say you or I or any one person, but if people across the United States, millions of people start thinking, I'm a little nervous about the bank. I think I'll go take some money out of my checking account. Let's say we'll start off again with some situation where maybe you have $300 in the bank and maybe initially it's $50 in currency and maybe $250 in your checking deposit. But then you get a little bit nervous, and, and you don't want to just stop doing business with the bank, but maybe you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get $100 out of my checking account and just get cash. Well, this ratio to begin with is mm, what? This ratio of currency to deposits will be one-fifth, right, or 0 0.20. But if people go to the bank and get another 100 bucks, this ratio changes. It becomes one fifty over 150, or 1 over 1, or 1.
Are you with me on this deal? So let's calculate our multiplier again. Just a moment ago, probably I erased it. I gave you that problem where just a moment ago our multiplier for M1 was equal to, what, 1.42 over 0.59 equals, does anybody remember that number? 2.4 what? 0.7. See if everybody like mumbles at the same time, it's like I'm going deaf. What? There. Thank you. That's to begin with. Oh, that won't work because I just used a different number. What am I going to do? The easiest way to do this would be to change this, wouldn't it be, to 0 0.20. OK, do a new calculation. Pardon me. 1.20. over 0 0.37. 2.243. Is that it? OK, thank you. See, there is something to be said for preparing lectures before showing up in front of a class. Now, what I'm saying is this. Back in the 1930s, there was this anxiety about the safety of deposits. Some people started going to the bank and asking for currency. When they do that, forget about banks like failing and so forth. Banks start saying, okay, I'll provide currency. The banks do that. This ratio changes from 0.2 to 1. And now let's go back and see what we have. The M1 multiplier now would be 2, yes, over 1.17. How much is a multiplier? One point what? Is this like a, a strike? 1.71? Is that it? And nothing else after that? Oh, thank you. Is it, does anybody else know? You know, I'm going to be out there. 094. Okay, I'm just going to give no extra credit for coming to class today. Um, let's go back and use a, uh, a monetary base. Again, I'll just keep it at $1,000. Boo. <laughs> monetary base of $1,000. So here our money supply would be 3000 $243 and now $1,709. What's happened? People got nervous. They didn't want to trust their currency to banks. So they took that currency out. Bankers were using that currency to make loans. And now bankers all of a sudden say, you know, we had to give that money back to people, that currency. We don't have funds to make loans anymore. Somebody come in and apply for a loan, they say no. Somebody pay off their loan, the banker say, good, I've got somebody standing in the line that wants that and give it to them. Don't like somebody pay your loan off and now the bank make another loan. No, no more loans. And this lending is what caused the money multiplier to exist and when the bankers are handing their currency back to customers, they're not making loans and the money supply goes down. And here is, it's not quite a half, but it's a substantial part in just this example. Well, guess what? I told you it was in the 1960s that economists figured this out. And so in the 1930s, people didn't know. And the Federal Reserve didn't know. And yeah, we know this. You can look and go, oh, that bank closed its doors. And you can get concerned about that. But this happens if nobody closes their doors. If the banks continue operating, they're just shrinking their loan portfolio, saying no loans, no loans. And when people are standing in line and they say, I want currency, I want currency, bankers are selling their treasury bills, they're selling corporate bonds, they're selling municipal bonds, they're getting rid of these securities in order to pay out this currency. And what's happening is the money supply is going down, down, down. 
And so what happened is in 1930 through 33, really through the end of 32, very early in 33, but the money supply fell by about a quarter as a result of this happening. Now, if the Federal Reserve had been alert to all this stuff, what they would have done is said, hey, look, the money multiplier is shrinking. We will increase the monetary base. We don't have to keep the monetary base at 1,000. We'll make it 2,000 or whatever the number would be. And we can keep the money supply the same. But they didn't have this figured out. They didn't know about the multiplier. And so they just sat there and watched this happen. And then later on, I told you about this book last time, uh, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz did the study, this monetary history of the United States. They went back and said, hey, look what happened. And people went, huh, how about that? That's amazing. And this is all because people decided they wanted to hold currency rather than checking accounts because they were worried about checking accounts. Okay, guess what happened in 2008, 2009? The financial markets were in this stage of, you know, you can say crisis, but it went beyond that. There was some panic there. And people started going, oh, man, I don't know if my bank's going to fail. And some people started going to the bank and saying, I'm not going to make a deposit. I want my money back. And especially those people who had large deposits or in companies with large deposits, I want my money back. And so what happened was the FDIC said, oh, look at this. This currency deposit ratio is starting to go up. And what they do? They ex increased... FDIC coverage, insurance coverage from 100,000 to 250, and say, no, don't worry about that. You leave that currency there. If your bank fails, you still get your money back up to a quarter of a million dollars. And so what happened at that point was this lesson from the Great Depression had been learned, and we didn't allow that currency deposit ratio to go up. It, it did a little bit, but it did not go up in a massive amount, and the reason it didn't is we knew what was motivating people, the fears, and then actions were taken, more deposit insurance and so forth, actions were taken in order to offset that fear. Okay, here's the other thing. In the, what, 1935, and it was really in the period leading up to that, and now I want to talk a little bit about this ratio of excess reserves to banks, uh, to deposits at banks. But in 1935, and really it was 34, 35, 36, what was happening was this. Great Depression is going on. If you're a banker in a Great Depression, here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, gosh, interest rates are nearly zero. Interest rates got very, very low. Just as interest rates got very, very low in 2007, 2008, 2009. And so if you're a banker in, in 1935, you're going, wow, interest rates on loans are 1%. That's not much. And then you were thinking, hey, in 1935, this is the Great Depression. If I make a loan, I may not get that money back. No matter whether this is a great company or not, or a great individual borrower or not, I may not get that money back because there's stuff working here that's broader than just the individual situation. There are these national trends. There's a lot of risk out here. And so if I loan this money out and get 1%, 2 3% interest, but there's a massive amount of risk, that would be stupid. And so low interest rates to begin with, then a lot of risk. I don't know if I ought to be making loans. Maybe I ought to just sit on top of those funds. When a deposit's made, just hold it, not lend it, not take the risk for a tiny little interest rate. And the third thing is this. If you're a banker in 1935, you've just seen, what, 10,000 banks wiped out over the preceding few years. And then what you say is, gosh, tomorrow, who knows, tomorrow, the next day, next week, next month, People could line up outside the bank and just say, I want my money, I want my money. And so if you're a banker, then what you say is, maybe I had to hold on to a bunch of cash here in the vault, just waiting for a panic if one occurs, you know, a bank run. I want to be able to pay those deposits out so they don't close the doors. And so what happened in the mid-1930s is this, a combination of low interest rates, high risk, and the possibility of a bank run caused bankers to hold a lot more excess reserves. And so this ratio was going up, and it didn't stay at, in our example here, 0.17. Maybe it went to 0.3. And when that ratio goes up, it's the denominator in these fractions. When the denominator gets larger, the banker is just setting dollars to the side and not making loans. 
And loans are how the money multiplier is bigger. It's how the money, money supply grows. If the banker is not making loans but just sequestering that money in uh, the vault cash or at the Fed, then what that means is the money multiplier is smaller, the money supply is smaller. And so <laughs> let me kind of back up. In the first half of the Great Depression, the currency deposit ratio was going way up, and that was driving the money multiplier down, and the money supply collapsed. And then we had a depression because there wasn't spending. There wasn't loans, therefore no spending. And in the last half of the depression, what happened was excess reserves were high. Bankers were holding these reserves. And then that made the money multiplier smaller. And that wasn't quite enough. Here's the last half of that story. Bankers are holding a lot of excess reserves. And then the people running the Federal Reserve looked out there and they said, gosh, you know, banks are holding a lot of excess reserves. This sounds almost fabulous, unbelievable, but it's what they did. Banks are holding lots of excess reserves. If they started loaning those excess reserves, huge loans would enter the economy. The money supply would go up rapidly. There'd be a lot of spending. We could have an inflation problem before you know it. So here the, these people are running the Federal Reserve, worried about inflation in 1935. And now, of course, we know Great Depression, no, we didn't have an inflation problem. Deflation was a problem. Price is going down, not up. But still, they were worried at the Federal Reserve. They said, oh my gosh, all these excess reserves could be loaned, could enter the economy as money supply, could stimulate the economy so much we have inflation. So what did they do? What they said is, we better get rid of those excess reserves. Let's double the required reserve ratios. So whatever they were before, we'll double them. And so the denominator on this fraction went up some more. They did this in three steps in 1936 and 1937. Doubled required reserve ratios. And then within very few months, there was the sharpest downturn, second sharpest downturn on record. And so anyway, we really had two depressions in the 1930s. Each one was very sharp, very deep, but when they came together and so closely together, we call the entire decade the Great Depression, but it was really two really serious contractions or recessions all put together. And both stories, both halves can be understood by looking at this money multiplier. The one is people being uncertain about the safety of their deposits, wanting to hold currency. This ratio going up. What did I say? Well, this is hypothetical. And in the second half, it's bankers are holding more excess reserves, and so then the Federal Reserve responded by doubling required reserve ratios. Let me just mention to you, and then I've got a question out here, and, and I'll take that, but let me just mention that in, 19, or in 2009, the fear was, oh, the Federal Reserve has put a lot of funds, a lot of liquidity into the economy. We could have huge inflation. Ooh, I'm worried. What are we going to do? Banks are holding a lot of excess reserves. Maybe we ought to get those excess reserves out of their hands take liquidity out of the economy? And the answer to that is no. Those banks are holding, we're holding, uh, excess reserves for the same reason in 2009 as they did back in 1935, 36, 37. Low interest rates, a lot of risk on their loan portfolio, and then also uh, the possibility that they would need cash in a short period of time. And so bankers hold a lot of excess reserves. So anyway, what I'm saying to you is that this money multiplier has got a lot to tell us about the Great Depression. You it. I answered it. Lucky I kept talking. Okay, so any questions about any of this before we go on? Oh, you do have another question. So you have two questions. If I kept talking, maybe I'd answer it too. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. In 1935, 36, 37. Okay. How, I mean, how? Yeah, why aren't they just holding up? Well, right. Okay, here's the thing. Here's what a banker's. Okay, so bankers are holding a lot of reserves. 
okay, in 1935, 36, 37. And why would they hold so much reserves? Well, there's fear, of safety. There's a fear, but guess what the fear is caused by? Leading into the Great Depression, they said this, oh gosh, if there's a bank run and people start asking for cash, I'll just go to the Federal Reserve and get a loan at the discount window. But now they say, that didn't work. I need to have my own reserves here, my own little stockpile of reserves in the vault because the Federal Reserve will not do its job. That's their thinking. And so then the Federal Reserve came along and said, oh, there's so much reserves, we got to basically, they're not going to confiscate them, but they're going to like force the banks to hold them, force them to hold them by saying, those are required, you cannot loan those out. All right. And then the banker said, oh, okay, well, if we can't let those go, then we'll just get some more. Okay, and so what happened was bankers, when they doubled these required reserve, bankers just said, okay, I'll reduce my lending and I'll get some more excess reserves. So the, the Federal Reserve, um, by the way, Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal Reserve, I can't tell you what year it was, but I'm going to say 2006, he was at the Federal Reserve, 2006 is the year he became chairman. And so he went to, I told you who wrote this book, Monetary History of the United States, Milton Friedman, Anna Schwartz. And so it, Milton Friedman was 90 years old that year. And they had a birthday party. It was his 90th birthday party. Huh. Anyway, so Ben Bernanke went to the uh, birthday party. And he's, uh, so he gets up and he speaks. And he says, Milton Friedman, you know, great economist. And we've learned so much for, from you, blah, blah, blah. And then he said, I've never heard this before. You were right. We caused the Great Depression, the Federal Reserve. We did it. We caused it, but we've learned from you, and we won't do it again. And so what happens is, 2007, 2008, 2009, Ben Bernanke's at the head of the Federal Reserve. Some of these same things start happening, and the Fed did learn from that experience and did not commit the same mistakes, and so we avoided a Great Depression in, you know, 2000, whatever, nine. You had your hand up. One of you. You did. You wanted to do that thing where Milton Friedman was 90, so they had his 90th birthday party. That's what you want to know about? Oh, another question from you. You're going to have to pay extra tuition. Uh, <laughs> is it entirely necessary to have required reserves? Is it necessary to have required reserves? Uh, you know, sometimes you'd say no, and sometimes yes. Um, Probably bankers would hold, you know, and, and what I've told you is this, is that the small and medium-sized banks have required reserves of 3%, and then, I'm sorry, the small banks, and the medium-sized and large ones, 10%. And so probably most banks would hold around, most medium-sized and larger banks would hold around 10%, even if there were no required reserves. And so it's not necessary under those circumstances. On the other hand, does it hurt? You know, if they were going to hold 10% anyway, does it hurt to say hold 10%? And so it's probably not a big deal under normal circumstances. And I guess where it will make a difference is if things aren't normal, then it may make a difference. In reality, that required reserve ratio is set and doesn't change very often. Some countries have gotten rid of required reserves. But you know, those countries that have done that are much smaller with much simpler banking systems we have got uh, the biggest economy in the world by a factor of about you know, three times as big as the second biggest economy. And then we have, what, 7,000 banks, and the next biggest country has got maybe, I don't know, a few hundred banks. And, so, uh, and then we've got a two-tiered reserve system where that some banks 3%, others 10 And so uh, it may be smart to keep some rules there just in case. I don't know. There's not a lot. I would say this. If it's a big problem, we'd hear bankers saying, get rid of this, get rid of this. And bankers are not really saying too much about it. But it is true that if we go back to the days of the early banks, the goldsmiths, they held some reserves even without being required to. You know, this all just emerged in the marketplace, and they did it anyway. Let's talk about monetary policy. And we'll just get started on this, and then we'll pick up with it next time. Here's what we have with monetary policy. M1 money supply is equal to the monetary base times that multiplier.
right? The Federal Reserve has three tools for conducting monetary policy. Two of those tools operate by affecting the monetary base, and then one affects the money multiplier. And so when we talk about monetary policy, and gosh, how does that work? Every single time that we talk about one of these Federal Reserve policies, we can either relate that back to the monetary base or to the M1 money supply, uh, the M1 multiplier. Okay. First, and I will not go beyond just naming this, we have open market operations. And that is about 95%, maybe more, of monetary policy. These other tools are more theoretical than actually used on a continuing basis. And these open market operations affect the monetary base, and it's basically the Federal Reserve buying and selling securities, bonds, from bankers. And that is where we'll leave it for today. We'll pick up with this next time. You should be reading your book about this. So long.